head of delivery at the company ThinkSolver, joining us from Serbia. Miloš is an experienced data engineer with a demonstrated history of working on data projects across different industries such as banking, retail, human resources, and so on. He's highly skilled in Python, big data, data analysis, ETL, data science, and data engineering, a lot of data words here. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree focused on information technology from the University of Belgrade, the Faculty of Organizational Sciences. And now a bit something about the ThinkSolver is a data analytics and engineering company located in Belgrade. They are operating worldwide in efforts to find the most valuable approaches and solutions for handling data. They are made of agile and competitive teams that believe that they have to be flexible and smart to efficiently answer all the challenges. They are working with cutting edge technologies and approaches and they are highly committed to open source solutions and share of the knowledge. So I said everything I think. Let's see the videos and after that, Miosh. So yeah, today we have a topic of data governance, which is a topic that uh, like we, we can read a lot about it. We hear a lot uh, about how important it is, but when we get to use cases in the real implementations, many people are struggling, and there are not many uh, interesting and, uh, and clear cases how to do data governance, what does it mean, and how to really implement it. 
So all your thing solver, data governance, let's say culture, is not something that we wanted to do, it's something that we had to do. And I believe nobody, it's not the sexiest job of 21st century, nobody wants to go and do the, deal with the data governance because it's difficult, because you have to deal with your organization and uh, different people and data sets and their responsibility and ownership and processes. So, it's, it, especially for developers, it's quite more complex than going and crunching your data. So I think Solar, it all started, uh, let's say, organically, based on the need when we had to process that amount. And we grew over time our use cases. As here, when it comes to data governance, and I'll share more details which, for, which sides of data governance we implemented, what we're working on. Uh, we basically had two big projects, if I can say, that are related to data governance. One is related to our product, Solar AI Suite, where we had challenges to deal Structure, deal with structured data, but not to the end. So many things were unclear about how data is organized and, and uh, how do we process it and who is responsible for data to be available and who is responsible to run the models on top to ensure which kind of, uh, let's say, analytics we are showing on top. And second is a project that we run for a, a customer in US where we basically deal with different let's say, sets of semi-structured data to, to support them. And during these two projects, which are still ongoing, we try to use some good practices how to handle with the data. So uh, in those uh, projects over four years, we really managed to go into specifics and details in, of many things when it comes to data governance, such as data cataloging, describing your data, uh, data quality checks, and there are some things that we are still working on. So I believe when it comes to data management and data organization and, and uh, data governance, it's not a project that you implement, you finish it and that's it because everything changes constantly. So it's really more about the process and how your development team and how, how the people that are crunching your data, how they approach uh, yeah, dealing, dealing with it. And uh, yeah, at the end, how do we uh, handle all those changes and who is responsible to, to deal with it. Yeah, and as you promised, this is going to be a very a, a lot of use cases and uh, real case examples. So let's start with the first one. When we are talking about data governance, uh, one of the most important topics actually is data quality because it's not it doesn't we are we are not sure what our data are. But uh, after that, model value and business value is uh, not say diminished. Okay, you can have you have the same uh, let's say uh, same line of uh, not. Uh, of, but even if that, the quality is not the same, but the, uh, the, the mistake is the same, you can have trends, but that's not the case, so that, that's not the point. Uh, my question to you, how do you ensure the quality of data from your perspective? Can you give us a few t uh, tips and tricks? And the second one, can you give us an example on this topic, what did you do in some concrete uh, case? Yeah, of course. Well, data quality is, I believe, uh, one of the topics that we uh, touch base mostly on. And it, basically, if you're dealing with the data on a daily basis, you're you have to deal with some data quality validations and stuff. What we did is try to put a more, let's say, coherent and more uh, organized approach. How do we deal with the data, data sets? First of all, it started with uh, clear definitions. So, for example, I think Solver, our product, we're working with different customer data, transactions. So mo most of our customers are uh, for the product are from retail and e-commerce. So we have customer or client or consumer. So we started going from those definitions, like how do we name our columns? So if, if, is, is it the customer, is it the or client, is it the consumer? So we really started documenting everything in Confluence. So I gotta say the first step is Confluence, Google Docs, or something else that you're using for documentation. And it's a boring process because you have to go and write down everything. Uh, when we talked over the years, years to many customers about data governance and similar topics, Everybody is excited until they realize that they have to go and document their data and document validations. And it's not something that you can do upfront. For some things, yes. For example, if you're working with, I don't know, customer table, and you're expecting to have unique customer IDs. If you're working with transactions, same thing. If you're working, if you have transactional data, you're expecting, for example, for the amount not to be null. So those kind of things can be easily uh, understood and implemented. And some topics really appear over time because you cannot anticipate in the beginning all the stuff that could go wrong. For example, here's the, the, the case that we saw over time. Uh, we have one table where we have two fields. One is quantity, and let's say second one is the, the amount. 
So somebody, when they input the data, they change these two columns. So in the column where we have quantity for, I don't know, number of laptops sold, we have 200,000 as, as the number, which is the mistake that is caused by human error when someone was computing the data. Maybe somewhere in the input is those two fields were close together. So how we try to do the, these things is really to build a tool set where we can implement all of those validations and show to our customers your data is wrong. For example, in this case, uh, the customers wanted to basically go and manually input this data and just to or exclude it from those tests. But that's not a good, not good, a good approach. Uh, we just implemented tests on top of our data to show which numbers are incorrect. We added measures how later in the processing pipeline just those values, but never to go and really change your data because this is how data arrive at, at the beginning. So this concept of hidden policy in general in analytics is really important. So those kind of practices really helped us to deal with data quality. So first of all, we knew some stuff from the beginning, like of course we are expecting for some ID to be unique in a certain table. We know which values should and shouldn't be uh, nulls. And some things basically appeared over time, we grew from our experience. Uh, the crucial step here was really to get the tool set that, is, that enabled us to do this. For example, for all these SQL-like uh, transformations, we're using open source tool co uh, called DBT, which basically provides SQL transformation, and you just implement your tab uh, in code. There are other uh, tools, libraries in Python, and different stuff you can use uh, to, to implement data quality checks. Uh, but at the end of the day, it needs to go to the business. So for, for some topics, it's not hard to understand and really conclude, okay, this is how the validation should work. So I think this is one of the largest uh, challenges of, of data governance in general, because we really need to put people from business, from tech, from delivery, from product, from integrations, all those people together to really discuss uh, yeah, what, which, which uh, data validations we need to implement. And once, let's say, so things over, we set up regular meetings. So whenever, once a week, we sat together and we just basically uh, listed out all the discrepancies that we see in the data. And uh, one thing where our customers uh, showed a great reaction, I think it's a good approach, is uh, if you are able to identify a certain mistake, we still show it in the data, but we notify to our customer okay, this data seems incorrect, please go take a look into it. And from my experience, from our experience, it, it, it's really a good practice because you're transpar transparently communicating to your end users what could be wrong with the data. Uh, I mean, we are working with the data and uh, yeah, mistakes happen. So data gets dirty, data uh, in some cases is not correct, is not accurate, is not what we're expecting. And it's really important to be aware of all of those discrepancies to transparently to communicate them to the customer and then customer can decide what we should and shouldn't do with it. In terms of data quality validation, since we're talking about it, we basically implemented two set of tests for our pipelines. So we have breaking, let's say, errors. So if something changed the data and we see that all of our, let's say, reports and analysis and machine learning models cannot work on top of this data, we just break the pipeline. We don't want to run it. We don't want to run a new recommendation for the customer if we see that we have those breaking uh, tests not passing. And we have, well, I don't know, if some description uh, is missing in, in some field and we're not relying on those descriptions, we will just communicate a warning to our customer uh, that something is weird in the data, but it's not affecting their use cases and day-to-day -day, uh, decision making based on, based on the reports and analysis we are generating. So I think this is one of the uh, largest benefits that we gain to give to our customers is that we transparently tell them, of, of course, in the first place, we give them our models and, and the insights, but on the other side, they know what data they are working with. It's not, uh, let's say, end of the world if, if uh, your customers don't see, for example, if you're, we are talking, for example, about uh, reporting and BI, if they don't see data from yesterday, maybe data didn't arrive or, or it's running late or stuff like that, but it's really important if the customer is looking at the reports today that they know what data they are looking into. For, so they, they should respect the data from yesterday didn't run. So those kind of practices really helped us to get up to speed, to really speed up our process and our investment uh, and, and our resources spent in, in different integrations for our customers once we have 
a unique data model and quality checks for, for all the implementation, like, okay, these columns need to be accurate and valid. Okay, this sounds very interesting because <clears throat> what I can take, like, for to, 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 let's say, the most important thing is the first one is uh, open and transparent communication with the clients, and the second one is uh, value and uh, trust your models. So basically, uh, have something that is uh, constant and build from that uh, of all the others, which is, I think it's a really, really great approach, like, because if we go constantly do re-over modeling, 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 maybe from that data it will show that in the end, maybe we learned that some, 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 some anomaly basically showing us some kind of trends in the end, like, so basically we are not, we are not just uh, putting it aside. This is like a good story also, how I managed to, 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 to do in the previous years so many of scientific research not to just say, okay, we're not going to these results. Let's say, why do these results appear? And this is good, uh, the first part is uh, the excellent, uh, let's say, intro for the second question. And that, uh, that's the some the thing that first my mind is that uh, metadata layer. That people do forget about it because, okay, like people say, okay, we will do that in the end. And after that, in the end, we have a lot of problems doing this. So, but my question is even more specific, like uh, how, uh, how hard can it be to create Metadata layer, especially in a bigger organization. Well, it's really difficult. <laughs> it's really difficult because uh, I don't know people, uh, like especially large companies, we are not aware at all, all times which data points we have at all, where are they coming from. So this is really a great uh, challenge to to first of all document all of these data points where they are coming from, and. Uh, one thing, of course, this is how we are doing everything at Think Solver, is let's do it in, in iterations. Let's do it step by step. Let's eat the frog first, let's build fast. So let's first focus on says that we are using day, on the day-to-day -day basis. For example, if you're a bank, you can go and document your core banking data because you know where it's coming from. You know who is generating this data, you know what is data source. And then later on, let's deal with more, let's say, unstructured data. If we are getting data, some data scraped from the web, or we are getting something from, I don't know, Twitter or some other social networks, so something that's not, let's say, uh, the core, our core business. So let's start with the things that we are using on a daily basis. It is a challenge. In my career, uh, for the last eight years that I'm working in Think Solver, uh, basically I only worked with one person that was excellent in documenting user requirements and describing data points that we have in the in the in the inputs and it's love to do that so uh, it's really a, a strange person I gotta say nobody likes to do that but then we work with one person that really liked to do this and it was really a great success for our project because we uh, saved so much time in later phases in data processing where we first of all uh, our data, data sets uh, we knew what every column means uh, so for, it started all by documenting it in, in Confluence and then we added some tools, for example, like DBT, where we have the capability to document all the inputs, outputs, and also describe all the columns, uh, relations between the columns, define the different relations between tables and stuff like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, tools are just, just there to help us to do, do our work easily. It's uh, more easily to, to be faster in the implementation. The crucial thing is to find the, the data sets that are used on a daily basis, that are crucial for any KPI or any metric that someone is uh, in charge of, that uh, we measure our business by, and document the inputs. And besides documenting the inputs and which columns we have, it's also important to define the ownership. Like who is responsible, which team? Uh, doesn't have to be a person, but which team is in charge to, to ensure that we get our, I don't know, CRM reports on a daily basis and that we get our core data in, in, I don't know, real time and that we get our customer transactions or, I don't know, clickstream data uh, in, in real time so to be, that we are able to serve, uh, yeah, serve to, to our customers. Uh, we had a challenge on one on the second project that I mentioned uh, that we worked on uh, last year, actually started two years ago and we are still working on adding more, more things to the model. Uh, it's a never-ending battle, but we had a challenge that we have data points that are coming from different applications like ATSs and the HR information systems and uh, different applications where we have, for example, open positions and uh, job description, stuff like that. So data really changes on a daily basis. So our customer has really challenges to understand in the morning when, when those guys wake up 
what changed for which customer and what they need to do to their SQL model, to their data warehouse model. So they are able to provide their reports until, I don't know, 11 a.m. in the morning so that their users, business users, can really make the decision, decisions for their business. So a uh, simple thing that we implemented, because our data rise to S3 and then the rest of the pipeline is triggered by uh, different uh, lambdas and different parts of, of, of tools that we use on AWS. Uh, but we just basically documented all of our columns. So we say, okay, these are the columns that we are expecting. And if something changes, we again added validation. So is it a breaking change or not? And every change is sent to Slack channel. It's a simple integration. Like you don't have even to program anything to push notification to Slack. You can use so many open source projects to do this. But this transparency and this information, you know, like, okay, data arrived, this is what changed. We started from documenting the model, documenting just the column names and data types, and later on we added data quality checks. Okay, now customer ID, yesterday it arrived as a string, today it arrived as, as an integer. Uh, and then uh, this cu customer ID is missing, but you will have a new field for client ID. So all of those, let's say, visible notifications that we send to the customer are, are quite important. Uh, and of course, metadata cataloging, because uh, adding descriptions of all the, the data that you use, uh, because it also helped us to onboard people faster. So if there are new people joining the team, if there is a new team that works on, on another project based on the same data points, we just have a clear definitions of, of columns that they can understand and then go from it and, and really work on it. So we don't have to waste time uh, every every time we have a new use case or a new person joining a team to go through all the explanation. It's easier. So it, it's a boring job, but once you get it done, it really helps helps a lot. Okay, uh, my, my last question for you before, before we start Q and A session uh, is uh, what are the crucial steps needed to be done um, so the organization can ensure the high quality uh, data governance? Well, uh, I managed to see in the past few years when it comes to data governance projects that many companies start really big projects, big expectations, uh, which ends up in some waterfall uh, without a clear goal or vision what should be prioritized first. As with any business, anything that, that anybody is doing, prioritization is really the most important because you really need to understand what, what is the uh, the main goal and what is the main gain that you're getting from your data governance and, and the whole data culture implemented. It's best, the best case scenario is if it's use case driven, if you have clear, clear use cases and, and uh, important use cases that really have to push you to go there. Uh, so prioritization is the most important thing and next to it is definitely uh, to, to put all the people together to really uh, put people in charge, both business, tech, sales, I don't know, delivery, everything else, to put them together to really, really understand what does it mean to, I don't know, implement data quality. What is the gain that we, uh, that, that we will get from it? What, uh, what uh, for example, am I as a new manager getting? What the team lead is, is getting as a benefit? And in the end, how does it translate to customer, to what customer gets, to the final delivery that we give to our customer. So once we have those in place, of course, it's not, it's not an easy job, but uh, if we really have a clear, let's say, support and alignment on all levels, then just going into sprints and uh, solving things uh, one by one, it's, it's way easier, because of course, without it, uh, we cannot go, we will go nowhere. And uh, yeah, my message here is that it doesn't have to start huge, like with a uh, waterfall project that ends in five years. It should start small, step by step, and then in, in iterations, go and fix things and see if, if you're really getting good benefits from it. For example, for our customer that uh, had issues with daily changing data from ATS, HRS, and stuff like that, we're currently saving them uh, three man hours. So that's the estimation they get, uh, like three man hours on daily basis that they spend for different checks and uh, of course one part to it is automation, but that's a, that's a huge uh, saving for, for them because 
let's say three of their analysts have one hour per each day to spend on something else, to build a new report for the customer, to go and investigate uh, some sites, and they don't have to go and manually check what changed in the data and what happened to our data and why the pipeline didn't run. So yeah, transparency is, uh, is the, the, the largest benefit, the, the huge benefit. Okay, uh, if I understand correctly, now I would like just to make like some conclusion. Uh, when we talk about the real case implementation of data governance, like uh, uh, first of all, it's very important to understand the whole process. The second one is to be very completely honest with your clients and to show them what are uh, what is happening in every moment, so you can have clear communication. Uh, also, the important thing is to believe in yourself and your models, what you are doing, and uh, how to do so. Let's uh, to eat the first frog, big frog first. To start with the big one, the core business, and after that, using the other things to see what they are happening. To, to uh, after that, also to communicate with the clients honestly that you will not have it by the night. Everything be ready, so that it's going to be a process that's going to last. But to give them a clear cut of what they are going to get. Last but not the least, it's also very important, if I understand correctly, to use to, to build the process through the iteration and to build upon the process and to learn also the process you can you can fastly change if something is what you have in mind, like for the whole 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 project it can be changed like because you can see that there can be additional value to it if you do something differently. If I understand correctly. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. And one uh, one thing that also people usually think when it comes to data governance that it's hard to measure, but turns out it's not because at least you can measure how much time your people spend on a daily basis to go and check some pipeline or check some data, whether it changed or not and what, what changed. So at least the, those, <laughs> those metrics could be measured. You can measure how much time you invest in certain data quality checks manually. Uh, thank you, Milos. Uh, can we get one round of applause for Milos? <laughs> okay, uh, so we have time for a Q&A session. So my question is, do, is there some question from the public? So Tom, share this completely open. You can ask if you have any kind of questions. Okay, I have one prepared question as well. Uh, what was the hardest challenge you had uh, on data governance project you need to deal with? That comes first to mind, like pain point you had personally. Not maybe the quality dish, but you as a person. Uh, stop people from putting things into Excel spreadsheets <laughs> and organizing that data in some sort of way, whether it's a uh, let's say a mapping file that someone maintains, but really getting the responsibility for all of those mappings, because, yeah, let's be honest, we all, always, in most cases, we are going to have some Excel, some mappings, and some things that we, that somebody inputs manually, in many cases, not all, all the cases, but really something, something that's happening regularly, but putting them, this into part of the process and getting really the, the ownership by a certain team for this, Excel, CSV, and stuff like that, so that they, once, for example, if we have, I don't know, a new shop that is open, just to input that data somewhere, that was the hardest challenge, because it really uh, took, for a certain customer, I think around a year to for, for, for people to start doing that, but once they started, like, they really managed to see uh, huge improvements in all the pipelines, analytics, and all the reports that they showed because we were able to report on all the business aspects of our customers. So. Okay, thank you so much for your honesty. Uh, once again, uh, because our time is up, uh, we'll round of applause for Milos and we are <laughs>